music to play during jangle time. But during jangle, yeah. up alone was impossible. <laughs> they laughed at it. How? My God, what? You know, they couldn't calculate what awful, you know? And prodigal son, and all the stuff was typical. <laughs> Now, people whistle on the street, you know? Not always in the street. No. Maybe in the bathroom. No. Mm -hmm. Balanchine's first ballet in America was given its premiere in June 1934 on the lawn of an estate in White Plains, New York, before an audience of invited guests. The host was Felix Warburg, father of Edward, one of Kirstein's classmates from Harvard. The ballet, set to Tchaikovsky's Serenade for Strings, was danced by students from the School of American Ballet. I started Serenade as evening classes to show how to be on the stage. I didn't have any idea to produce anything. Attendance at rehearsals was irregular, but Balanchine made a virtue of necessity and choreographed each section for as many dances as he had that evening. It was the summer of 1944, and back then, ballet and Broadway generally didn't mix. Until the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo was given an opportunity no other ballet company had ever had, to star in and choreograph a major Broadway show. I can't dance, you can't dance. It was incredible. We closed a big Broadway show with a ballet. No big thank you very much, ha ha, and no, a ballet closed the show. Freddy and his fiddle are at it. The show was the Song of Norway. The stars were Frederick Franklin and Alexandra Danilova. And the choreographer was none other than the company's original ballet master. George Balanchine. In the 12 years since he'd left the Ballet Russe, Balanchine had bounced from ballet to Broadway to Hollywood and the circus, working with showgirls and screen stars, ballerinas and elephants. In each case, his initial success had turned to failure, and he was now a man with few prospects. He was doing nothing. It, it was it. It was over for him at the time. Mr. Denham brought him into the company. He did the choreography for Song of Norway. And during that Song of Norway, he started Dance Concert Dance. Bourgeois Gentillon. The beginning of Ballet Imperial. The beginning of Sonambula. And Mozartiana. He wanted to get back into the ballet company again and get to where he belonged. And we were the, we were the company that he came into. We benefited from him and then he did too. With George Balanchine in a creative fervor and the Song of Norway a huge hit on Broadway, Denham asked Balanchine to be the company's resident choreographer. I never heard about Balanchine in Yugoslavia, not the word. So I come to America, and I am commanded that Balanchine wants me on stage pronto at 9 o'clock in the morning. And I said, yeah, who is Balanchine? He said, you don't know Balanchine? I said, no, I never heard of him. I said, but I don't think he's a gentleman because I am a lady and I am not commanded to be pronto on anybody's stage, so you better give him that message. That was my first message to Balanchine. Not very smart, <laughs> because with my kind of looks, he would have been very madly in love with me. Balanchine's ideas were an abrupt departure for the Ballet Russe. His arrival brought sweeping changes that proved controversial with critics, audiences, and the dancers themselves. The Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo was known for costumes, the scenery, and the music. And the Banachine works became no costumes, no scenery, and lots of lovely music. I remember thinking to myself, this is the first time I'm going on the stage and I'm nothing. 
I'm just a body. I have nothing to do but go on and waltz. I don't belong anywhere. I, we'd, never, we'd never had, we'd never danced like this. We'd been something, a tree or a something, we'd been, rinsed, we'd been something. I realized early on that I was not a Balanchine dancer. There was a certain form, even then, 43, very long legs, shorter torso. See, even then he was starting the image he wanted in his ballerinas. Small, sleek head. Not much emotion when you dance. Don't show emotion. Your body, the steps will show what I want to show. Valentin is interested in the movements of the female body. He liked to uh, make people. She must have seen me dance because immediately I was made understudy for Danilova and I have written in my diary how nice he is to me and this and that and you know and it wasn't much after that we were up in San Francisco or something and he asked me to marry him I said George I don't love you and he said but that doesn't make any difference love will come one day so I said, well, I don't know how to think about it. George and I were married in 1946, August 16th, 1946. I was 19, I think. He changed her whole technique. He told her she had no technique. After the performances, we'd all retire to a very fleazy little restaurant having spaghetti after the show, and Mr. B would be there with us, and he would have a big dish of spaghetti, too. And he always brought one apple with him, and that's all Maria could have, because he was getting her ready to be a ballerina, and she wasn't to put any weight on. As an artist, that was his interest, and she took it all in. George Balanchine remained with the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo for three successful seasons, but he was never named artistic director and had always dreamt of having a company of his own. He wanted his way, his doing things. He would only work if he got to be the king, or else he won't work. Now, with George Balanchine's reputation on the rise, the time was right for his dream to become real. With the help of his longtime patron, Lincoln Kirstein, Balanchine made his move. In 1947, he was leaving. He was forming a new ballet company. So she, she went with him, and it became the Ballet Society. Ballet Society was renamed the New York City Ballet, and by the early 1950s was a formidable rival in New York. New York had become America's dance capital, and Sergei Denham realized that the Ballet Russe needed its own foothold in Manhattan. In 1954, Denham founded an official Ballet Russe school on West 57th Street. Young dancers from all over the country flocked to the school, where the company held annual auditions for places in the corps de ballet. Yeah, I was a tap dancer and a singer, and I left Jacksonville, Florida, and came to New York, and I went to the Ballet Russe School and said, here I am. I auditioned for the Ballet Russe, and there was no question when they said yes that I wanted to go with them. I mean, they did Swan Lake and Scheherazade, and Freddie Franklin was with that company. <laughs> I had anything thing about being in the core was you had a really good family feeling about the people that were standing around you, whereas the ballerinas couldn't have that. I mean, they might have been at each other's throats. We weren't because we were all there trying to make it as good as we could. I was a little bit of a fanatic. I would get to the theater like 3 o'clock in the afternoon sometimes just to get my makeup, that every eyelash was in place. A little bit sick when I look back now. And, you know, it was very, very Barbra Streisand and funny girl. Of course, we didn't do anything in Swan Lake but walk on and look and look and <laughs> look for the swans and then stand and support them. We did no dancing, literally no dancing in Swan Lake. 
But when you were on the stage with that blue haze all around you, I can feel it now. And if I felt I was in a ballet company. It was very, very moving. It was the most fulfilling time that I had in the ballet groups. It was that moment, you know, just standing there with the music and the lights and, and the total rapture of the audience.